Late one evening, the young Lila Lee receives a letter from a mysterious stranger that reads, Dear Lila, I'm writing you this at your father's request. He is on his deathbed and constantly asks for you to come and forgive him for any harm he has done you. Come alone. If you tell of this or bring anyone with you, you will not be taken to him. The instructions to follow are enclosed. Because of your good works and intense devotion to God, I know you will not fail him. Signed, fellow Christian, Lamora. With this, we are thrown into the bizarre Southern Gothic world that 1973's Lamora is building that operates on strange motivations that are not often clear and fairy tale logic. Lila has been ostracized by her community as well as desired physically by everyone around her for their own pleasures. The time is the 1920s. Her father is a notorious bank robber who is known for having killed his wife and her lover. Lila is the subject of conversation about the town. False rumors spread about her sleeping with the local clergy. The newspaper shames her for the sins of her father. She is made an example of before her church congregation, a symbol of Christ's redeeming forgiveness. Described by the pastor as being cleansed of her parents' evil counsel, having through him been truly reborn. She leaves a note behind to the local pastor that reads, I'm going to see my father and forgive him. I'm still afraid, but I want more than anything to be a good Christian and to make you proud of me and ventures into a landscape that is openly hostile towards her, that sees her only as a commodity to be used, that looks to devour her at every turn. And this all works in setting up a story that is very much inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's Shadow Over Innsmouth. In some ways, it can be viewed as a loose adaptation of that tale, as well as Arthur Mation's The White People and the Irish horror vampire novel Carmilla. In fact, when Lila goes to purchase her ticket to go visit her dying father, the entire sequence involving the bus station and traveling on the bus is taken directly beat for beat from Lovecraft's story, including the people of the nearby town of Astaroth having the Astaroth look that visually distinguishes them from normal people. They just don't look right. According to the bus driver, you can tell them apart from normal people instantly. And from a storytelling perspective, this is a tool that works really well because we're left wondering and anticipating what these people are going to be like when we finally reach the town, when all of a sudden the bus gets attacked by them in the middle of the wooded wilderness, and we are able to see them as they truly are, and it is much worse than we ever imagined. A lot of aspects of this film are actually lifted from memories that seem to stand out in director Richard Blackburn's past. The song that the village hag sings to Lila is a song that his grandparents sang to him once as a child, called There Was an Old Woman All Skin and Bones. It's a song that I recognize as well from when I was a kid. I distinctly remember someone in my church singing it once, and even though it is never exactly stated where Astaroth is, I believe it is probably pretty close to where I grew up. At least, generally speaking, in a regional aspect of the American landscape. The song was popularized in modern times by its inclusion in the first scary stories to tell in the dark, which almost all entries in those books comes from American folklore and tradition. The earliest instance I can find of the song existing is a 1938 recording that was pressed in Indiana, although I'm sure it existed long before that. And I can't say for certain, but I believe that Blackburn was born or spent some time in Virginia as a kid. So a lot of the iconography and cultural bits that are lifted for the film seem to primarily come from this general area of the country, and that can be felt throughout the whole runtime. The world that we are presented with here from Lila's perspective is both nightmarish and hostile. The people around her look strange and dirty before even arriving in Astaroth. Everyone in the film has an opinion on Lila and her body, always making remarks on her without her consent oftentimes in extremely vulgar or disgusting predatory ways that reveal an underlying want to use her. A man beating a woman outside of a bar looks at her as she walks past and asks her if she's looking for a good time. The ticket salesman at the bus station refuses to let her leave without taking a chocolate from him, asking her if she prefers hard or soft candy. The bus driver forcibly pushes her back and locks the bus and starts to drive, even though she looks very visibly uncomfortable. It is a world of disgusting people, who only barely hide their attempts to consume her essence against her will in various ways. It is an overall comment on the nature of how women are treated by the outside world through every facet of life, often not being seen as people but instead as a thing that is intended to be used, without regard for how they might be affected. One man says to another woman about Lila that, if I was the preacher and her around, 
I'd sure have one hell of a time trying to keep my mind on Bible studies. She's ripe and ready to go. In a flashback, we see Lila say goodnight to him with a hug. The preacher rejects her touch, but on his face, we see that he wants more than anything to embrace her and to take more from her. And after she has gone to bed, he sits alone, confronting his attraction to her through reading Song of Solomon 7, a poem about a man's desire for a woman and her response. The two speakers of the text want each other and go together into a vineyard to make love in nature. One of the only instances from the Bible not only depicting lust without consequences, but also an instance saying that lust is a good thing, and that praise and love of the human form as a creation of God is a fundamental aspect of showing love to God. But in the context of this, it is perverted, made to be a dirty thing. Through this one shot, this text about affirming love for other people is made into an internal justification on the preacher's part of his inappropriate feelings for Lila as her legal guardian. It is about how the religious take scripture and twist its meaning to excuse any behavior that they want to participate in, showing how dangerous the malleability of language truly is. Richard Blackburn, the writer and director of the film, has stated that his primary inspiration behind creating it was the 1970s hit Count Yorga the Vampire. But in my mind, there is not a ton connecting these two, as Lamora, in a way to me, serves more so as an American reimagining of the excellent Valerie and her Week of Wonders that was released three years prior to this. A film about a girl on the edge of becoming an adult, who finds the world around her to be populated by vampires who wish to devour her, to use her body for their own wants and needs and pleasures without considering how she feels about it. It would shock me if Blackburn had not seen Valerie when making this, because thematically what both films are trying to say about transitioning into adulthood as a woman, and the role that organized religion plays in everyday life is extremely similar through the use of the vampire as a metaphorical vehicle of a monster. And I think these two films would pair well not only thematically, but also stylistically. He has also stated that Night of the Hunter and Moonfleet inspired the visual language of the film. One of my biggest complaints here is actually that Richard Blackburn was the one who made it, as he is a man writing this story about how women are treated. And this lesbian vampire movie might not be his story to tell. He doesn't have those first-hand experiences to really get to an actual truth there. But Valerie was written by a woman, Esther Krumbachova, and she was supposed to direct the film as well before she was told that she wasn't allowed to. And you can feel a real tangible truth in that movie. But it too was based on a novel by a man, and Carmilla was written by a man. And sadly, this is just the unfortunate case with a lot of stuff like this from this time period. There was only one type of voice that was allowed for all stories. This connection to Valerie and Carmilla, and vampires as a vehicle to talk about consuming others, as well as the theme of corruption, comes to full form when we meet the namesake of the film, Lamora. The tall vampire woman dressed all in black who steals Lila away, and has her father locked in a room at the back of the house as he slowly changes into a new thing. She exudes sexual energy, and her intentions are clear from the first moment that she and Lila are alone together, as Lila notices that she gives off no reflection in the mirror, to which she responds, The mirror is broken, but you can see how lovely you are in my eyes. This is both a tough and deeply uncomfortable movie to watch and to talk about. It is literally about watching this young person enter the world alone for the first time, only to see how everything around her is designed to exploit her and break her down for the wants of people who are in positions of power. It quickly becomes a film of taking Lila and destroying her slowly to fit the desire of a vision that is not her own, about how the allure of the vampire changes her. This first corruption that Lamora inflicts on Lila is that of drinking wine or blood, a perversion of communion. They sit together, the two along with Lamora's vampiric children, and as a group, they one by one drink the blood from the chalice. But the context of this event is crucial in differentiating it from the normal communion that Lila is used to. This is done in the dark of night in secret, like it is an act to be hidden. Lila's gift is her voice, her ability to sing. She does this for her church every Sunday. But right here, after this parody of Remembrance of Christ, her gift is taken and forced to be used in a way that contaminates it. She is told by Lamora to sing for her and her children, just after sharing the blood together. Her gift is now tied to this profane ceremony that is sealed with a group dance, and a small piece of her is forever changed. 
It is soon after revealed that her father has transformed into a werewolf, or at least a werewolf-like creature. And after he escapes, he slashes her on the back before being driven away by a torch-wielding Lamora. And this cut upon her back is representative of the emotional harm that he has inflicted on Lila for her entire life. The scar that she receives from this is similar to the social stigma that she has been forced to wear for years. And this moment is the catalyst for her seeking comfort in Lamora. She shows her the wound that her father has cut into her and asks for comfort and a friend, opening herself to trust Lamora and seek refuge in a new kind of sanctuary in her home, an opening that Lamora will exploit to the fullest extent. Lamora draws a bath for her, shaming Lila into getting undressed and going into the tub in front of her by saying, I hope you're not embarrassed in front of another woman. Their relationship is one of a skewed power dynamic. Lamora takes the role of a mother figure as well as a sister and a lover, an abusive gray area that constantly keeps Lila in a confused, shifting mental state about what is going on here. The vampire attempts to gaslight her at one point by telling her a story about why she is at this home, saying, once upon a time, a little girl was born far across the sea in a small town like the ones around here. Yet, even though she was beautiful and loved by almost everyone, she could feel that something was after her, and she ran away, just like a lot of people do, who don't want to accept what they truly are. And so she kept running, running from what she knew she was, until she couldn't run anymore. That's when she came here. But this isn't the case with Lila. Despite her circumstances, she genuinely seemed happy in aspects of her life. She seemed to enjoy her church and only left because she was lured by the false story about her dying father. She was emotionally entrapped into this, and the story that Lamora tells seems to reflect more of her own history rather than the one that is being projected onto Lila, in a disingenuous attempt to comfort her that has the actual underlying goal of manipulating her into feeling closer to Lamora. And before we continue, I want to say that I don't actually think that this film is homophobic. The narrative would have been the exact same if Lamora had instead been Dracula. The vampire is just a metaphor of an abusive partner who uses sexual attraction and natural charisma to drain the life force of the person who has had the misfortune of entering their life. There's nothing wrong with queer themes, but in this situation, Lamora is definitely an invading force in Lila's life that is taking advantage of her weak emotional state and situation for her own personal desires. The vampirism is less of a symbol of queerness here than it is of pure toxic behaviors on the part of people with large amounts of power. In a lot of ways, the vampire is intended to be a parable of what it is like to find yourself caring for a full-blown narcissist in a situation that is slowly killing you and changing your personality to be more like theirs. And in that regard, I think it is important narratively that Lila is young and inexperienced in life, because this is a story about how people can, in those situations, take advantage of someone naive in the way of the world. Lamora eventually tells Lila that she intends to make her like she is through an ancient ceremony that is so old no one even remembers where or how it began, saying that, when you're going through it, it's so intense that sometimes you feel like you're going to die, but you don't. You live better than you've ever lived before. Vanity is a sin, Lila tells her, to which Lamora responds, the real sin is for a girl to deny herself life and joy, especially if she's as lovely as you. Eventually though, Lila decides to stand up for herself and rejects Lamora when she sees her for what she truly is, at which point a militia of torch-wielding vampires are sent out to capture her as she runs into the woods. And when found, she is cornered in an abandoned barn and Lamora reveals her true self, saying to her, Lila, did you really think you could escape so easily? The further you thought you were getting away from me, the closer you came. Lila, Lila, you never had a chance. Each one of your moves has been directed from the very beginning, like a chess game. My present is the opposite of death, it is life. A life that can never die. Why me? Lila asks her. I don't want it, I swear I don't. Oh yes you do. I know you better than you know yourself. We are one and the same, and until you realize that, you can never be happy. It has to happen, Lila. And with that, she takes Lila's innocence and remakes her into her own image. Lamora is a deeply uncomfortable movie to watch about a young person entering the world and facing the harsh realities that a person who has more power than them will eventually try to use that against them. It is also one of the best, most atmospheric genre movies of the 1970s, filled to the brim with weird things lacking context that 
makes the world feel large for a movie this short. A cutaway shot to the hag by herself chopping rancid meat, a town where the streets are littered with bodies. Frame pictures from the past that communicate with psychic messages, warning to not fall into the same fate as they did. It is all around a wonderfully mysterious work and is a really good movie to watch if you're craving more after finishing Resident Evil Village. The two honestly have a ton of similarities, from a tall vampire lady with her children, an old woman who speaks in cryptic threats, a village full of werewolves, and a missing family member being the primary motivation that sets off the events of the story. The film was truly a work of a small team creating independently trying to produce a unified vision. The executive producer was Richard Blackburn's father who appears in the film. His brother and sister can also be seen as background actors. They had no idea what they were doing, and things got so out of control that they ended up filming six script pages every single day just to get it finished before they ran out of money. They were going so fast that eventually they just threw away the storyboards because they got to the point of being useless when taking the amount of time they had left into consideration. What started with well-planned good intentions, as is often the case, devolved into outright chaos. But somehow something really fun and unique was born in that process. The film was screened on April 30th, 1973 at the Garrison Theater located on the Scripps College campus in Claremont, California. In her review of the event for the Progress Bulletin of Pomina, California, Sarah Smiley said that she felt the film would play well to art house audiences, but that your average horror fan might not find a ton to love here. Adding that despite its roughness, she felt there was a better movie hiding somewhere within it that might play better in more mainstream crowds. But apparently the tone in the room was a lot less receptive than this review lets on, as Blackburn was so panicked by the reaction from the people who saw it that evening that he sold the film to the Media Cinema Group as quickly as possible to recoup the money that they had spent on the project before negative word of mouth got out about the screening. They then took the film and cut it down from 118 minutes to the 80 minute version that exists today, which is even more dreamlike and hard to follow because of the missing context that those scenes provided. For instance, there is no explanation for the presence of the werewolves in the film, and I like to think that got more fleshed out in the longer cut of the movie. There's also this whole scene at the end where we just cut to the werewolves and vampires fighting each other in slow motion that has literally no context. And unfortunately, these scenes can be really felt in the last 20 minutes of the runtime. And as much as I like this film, I have to admit that meddling with it like this caused it to have a pretty bad ending that I don't think it would have originally had. There's a whole conversation that implies that Lila tried to kill Lamora that makes no sense because we didn't see that happen. And because of the cut footage, you end up with this amazing first hour and a bizarre last 20 minutes. Lamora got a limited national rollout with the intention of screening it mostly at late night drive-ins around the country. The film was horribly reviewed when it came out and it did poorly financially as well. And to top it all off because of the themes of the story, it was also banned by the Catholic Legion of Decency, one of the last films ever to have that distinction. And while a lot of films that were banned by the Legion like Rocky Horror, Taxi Driver, and Dawn of the Dead were mostly unaffected by this if not benefited from it, I think the religious nature of the story in Lamora really makes it a different case here. It feels like a movie that wasn't embraced like a lot of others in this time were. It was too trashy to play well to art house crowds but not trashy or violent enough for the exploitation grindhouses or midnight drive-ins. Joe Dante loved the film and became a friend of Blackburn's and worked to get it screened a few times over the years throughout the 80s at different genre film festivals. But the fact of the matter is that the initial distribution campaign was so poorly handled and reviewed that it resulted in this becoming one of the countless films that have been largely lost to history. And I think this is really tragic because you can really get a sense of a young filmmaker learning the craft in this work who was willing to explore some really weird ideas that wouldn't usually be touched in a somewhat competent style. Only for his career to get shot down here right before it could ever really begin. The story is really similar in a lot of ways to how Phantasm got made. Same time period, the funding for both projects was largely provided by the very young and inexperienced director's father, both exploring really weird ideas in a surreal, dreamlike way. Only one went on to become Phantasm, and the other didn't. It's sadly a story that you can find over and over again if you look hard enough. After this movie's failure, Blackburn would co-write Eating Raoul in 1982 and then write and direct an episode of Tales from the Dark Side in 1987. But that's 
pretty much it. And to think that we could have potentially had a whole career of well thought out horror films from him honestly makes me really sad to think about. I would have loved to have seen what else he would have done if given the opportunity. This was right before the horror boom of the late 70s and early 80s. And there's a world out there I think where Blackburn would have been one of those iconic last names that you just associate with retro horror. The title of this video is obviously hyperbolic, but that being said this movie has always been notoriously difficult to watch, to the point that it never became a cult hit because nobody ever really saw it, which is kind of a prerequisite for something to develop a cult following. Back in the day, in order to watch the uncut version, you had to import the Japanese Laserdisc that had subtitles in Japanese that you couldn't turn off. And then after that, the most common version you could find was a run of VHS copies for Midnight Video that was just a transfer of the Japanese Laserdisc that was done so poorly that there were entire scenes where you just couldn't tell what was going on because the visuals got so muddy. Today, it is not streaming anywhere. You cannot rent or buy it digitally on Amazon or any other video rental streaming platform. The only way you can watch it legally is by ordering the 2004 copy of the DVD through Synapse Films. And the unfortunate truth about this is that pretty much everyone who has ever seen this movie has watched it in an inferior way. Whether that be a bad VHS transfer with foreign subtitles that you can't remove, or if you see it today, with it only being available on a format that can only produce a fuzzy resolution of 480p. And the history of this has only made the title have all the more notorious of a reputation. There has never been a Blu-ray release despite confirmation that a 4K transfer was in the works back in 2016. And it would really just be nice if this film could receive a renewed interest in modern times, as there's just a lot to love about it. It doesn't feel like a movie that was made in 1973. But if you don't make it easy for someone to watch something in today's climate, then they aren't going to watch it. And at the moment, watching this movie is still pretty difficult. And I'd love to see a new remaster show up on Shudder or something like that. I think that'd be a great thing to see happen. It is the sad story about the results of what can happen to a person when they are surrounded by manipulative people who only care about their own wants or needs. Of personal liberation taken to an extreme, to the point of exploiting others and not caring about how their actions will affect anyone physically or emotionally beyond themselves. And how that can lead to harming someone to the point that they no longer resemble the person that they once were irrevocably changed by the events that they have been forced to go through. After giving in to his own desires and pursuing Lila once she leaves town, the preacher finds her in the end by herself in this town of the dead. He lies down with her and embraces her, only to look into her eyes long enough to see his death coming, while nearby Lamora broods over them having conquered Lila in both spirit and body.